So, in a strange turn of events that uh, has been happening, the Los Angeles Innocence Project has decided to take up the case of Scott Peterson. Now, Scott's wife, Scott is currently serving a life sentence. He was originally sentenced to death in 2004 for the 2002 murder of his wife, Lacey, and their soon-to-be-born son, Connor. This is a case that I remember at the time, but especially now, holidays, murders, like Christmas holidays, rings a lot in common with me. I'm Collier Landry. Let's get into it. Testimony continued today in the most notorious criminal trial. In when I was 12 years old, my testimony sent my father to prison for murdering my mother. I decided at an early age that our trauma should not be what defines us. It's what we choose to do with it that does. I'm here to share my unique perspective on true crime, mental health, society, and popular culture, albeit with a slight sense of humor. I'm Collier Landry, and welcome to my show. Mover Nation, happy Sunday, wherever you may be and however you may be listening or watching. Thanks for making me a part of your day. If you guys are in the Detroit area or the Tampa Bay and Florida area, you may be watching something like this. So thank you very much. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers playing the Detroit Lions. Uh, I am still recovering from last night when um, when I uh, watched quite a nail-biter of a game. My San Francisco 49ers were triumphant against the Green Bay Packers, who I was nervous about all week after they completely humiliated the Dallas Cowboys. But, well, it is the Dallas Cowboys. Sorry, Dallas fans. You're used to it. Y'all been dealing with this for decades. It's okay. Uh, but so a few of you wrote in uh, to me over the week, sent me some DMs and you're like, Hey, what do you, uh, you know, what do you think about this Scott Peterson thing? And the, the innocence project taking uh, on Scott's Scott's particular case. Now let's not conflate the two. This is the Los Angeles innocence project not the Innocence Project that is has over a million members, not the California Innocence Project, who I have interviewed Justin L. Brooks on this show before, who is an advocating attorney, got some very big, uh, big people out of prison. This is the Los Angeles Innocence Project. Now, to give you a little bit of background on them. So, and this, of course, is over the Twitter spheres and people are talking about it. That's why you guys sent it to me. Um, the Los Angeles Innocence Project is solely funded by a gentleman um, by the name of Andrew Leander Win Wilson, who was exonerated in 2017 after spending 32 years in prison for the crime that he did not commit. Um, so, I mean, this is a good thing. Obviously, someone who was incarcerated for something that they did not commit. We do not want to see that in this country. And as I've said many, 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 many times, the justice system is not perfect in this country, but it is the best in the world, at least in my opinion, and having a lot of experience it, with it as a victim, as a witness, and as someone who advocates for you know, justice. You know, what can I say? Uh, big shout out, by the way, thank you so much to Catherine Redinger, who just joined the Patreon yesterday, I believe. She joined for a full year. She will be getting, I believe, what Nightbot tells us is a free t-shirt. So if you guys want to sign up, you sign up, you pay the year in advance, you get a discount, and you get a free t-shirt um, of your choosing from my online store. So welcome, Catherine Redinger, to Mover Nation. We will all welcome you. Um, on that note, uh, I will be... Uh, uh, we will be having our members only meet and greet next weekend. We'll either be on Saturday or Sunday. We'll do a little quick poll about it uh, where we will get into all things Mover Nation. And it's a wonderful thing. We can have this live meet and greet. We all interact just like we do here on a live, but it's private and we all are on camera and it's really cool. And you guys have some great stories and there's a lot of great bonding that goes on. And I, I quite enjoy it. So uh, that will be coming up next weekend. That is for all my uh, my Patreon supporters at certain levels and YouTube channel members at certain levels. You guys get access to that. And uh, I'll be posting about that during the week. I would like to hear what y'all think about this Scott Peterson case, though. So full disclosure, I do not know much about Scott Peterson or Lacey Peterson. 
I moved to California when all this was going down. It took place up in Modesto. And um, I read a little bit about it. At the time, I was very much, um, I was very reticent to really pay attention to anything like this because I wasn't thinking about crime or anything in that nature. I wasn't doing what I'm doing now. I was just very, I was very, uh, you know, I was aware of what's going on. I thought it was absolutely horrific. A young mother is killed uh, and, and, and a baby and just, I mean, just all of it is really, really bad. Bodies being dumped. I know, I remember there was a lot of conspiracy theories at the time. People were talking about a robbery that had occurred across the street in a neighborhood. There's some van that was found at the Modesto airport. There's a bunch of stuff there. You know, it, it's interesting because this case is so old that I can literally look it up on chat GPT and it'll give me a response. This case has been around for so long. This is before, like we really had, we had smartphones. We really, you know, saw a proliferation of the internet. Like we weren't doing like the internet things. We didn't have ring cameras. We didn't have all that, which as I've talked about many times on the show, you know, are great evidence uh, that lies just right in somebody's doorstep or right in the palm of their hand where they can literally you know, record things that are going on. And uh, it's interesting to see how technology has really changed the justice system. I don't know if, you know, Scott was originally sentenced to death and obviously sat on death row in California, which is a weird sort of thing in and of itself because this is California. It's a very liberal state in a lot of ways, but to have uh, a, the death penalty, it's, it's an interesting thing. But uh, in 2020, uh, the Supreme Court of California overturned his his death penalty case, and then he was resentenced resentenced in 2021 for two for for life imprisonment, to a sentence of life imprisonment. So um, I want to hear what you guys think. Again, this was something that I just remember thinking was really crazy, and there was a lot of parallels. Right, there are a lot of parallels between my my father's case and Scott Peterson. Uh, minus the baby element. So there was a mistress that he had dated named Amber Fry. And she, it appeared at the time that Scott Peterson was going to win his trial. Now he was represented by Mark Garagos. Now, if you guys remember who Mark Garagos is or know who Mark Garagos is, Mark Garagos is a lawyer who is very well known in legal circles throughout the Hollywood community. And he is definitely not what we would say camera shy. Mark Garagos takes big cases. Mark Garagos takes on things in the same vein of like a Johnny Cochran used to, um, uh, uh, Shapiro. Um, you know, Mark Garagos had represented most famously Michael Jackson in his some of his trials. So there's a lot of um, there is a. He's a, he is somebody who much of, much of you guys, you know, we talk about the Murdoch controversy and every, everybody trying to be in front of camera and, and exposure, et cetera, et cetera. Mark Garros is very much one of those very hungry, attention seeking lawyers in the, in, um, the legal community. So, um, no problem with him. And probably honestly, if I was ever, uh, in a situation, I had a friend that hired him. Um, I, I use friend in air quotes, somebody that I knew when I first moved to Hollywood, hired him to try to get him some out of some trouble. I believe he did. Uh, you know, so yeah, there's a lot of, um, you know, you see Shapiro or you see Mark Garagos take on cases, especially after they've been tried. He, he comes in for appeal appeals hearings or retrial hearings and things of that nature. He's a headline grabber for sure. You can watch him on all the all the talk shows and everything. Uh, he's an interesting character for sure. Cat loves cat skills. Thank you so much, um, uh, so much for the super sticker. And we also had another super sticker earlier. And I want to give a shout out to Karen Isabel Stewart, who I believe I did in the comments. But thank you so much for the super sticker. All of this, and again, you know, to uh, Catherine Redinger for joining the Patreon in a full year advance membership. Thank you so much. Remember, guys. Your support is what makes all of this possible. Your support. And as the channel begins to grow and as you guys come in and, and recommend the channel and the subscribers keep going up and more people come and discover the channel, then it eventually can be something that will fully sustain and I can make all the content in the world. So if you're enjoying this, please click the like button. Please click subscribe. Please share with your friends and family and check out all my other videos because I got some good ones. Um, 
So let us get into there's so there's a couple podcasts that have come out. There's a couple podcasters. They have very conflicting opinions. They have very conflicting uh, ideas of what went on in the case, and sort of as most things with conjecture and both sides of you know these these um, contrarian views. Of course, you know there's a lot of conjecture that flies back and forth. And again, with the case being so old, right? You know, we're talking 2000. I mean, I can't believe I'm saying old. It's only what 22 years ago. But you know, so when the case I guess came to prominence was 2004 when he was finally on trial. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, stuff. Welcome, Lorna. By the way, welcome, Lorna. Welcome, little Miss, ba little Miss, maybe. Wow, welcome, uh, Vika, Vic, and Vin. I would love to hear. Uh, I'm proud of the UK and also feel proud of the EU too. I would love to hear uh, more about the international courts. Welcome on the outskirts. Welcome, welcome, Tinsy Fly. I haven't seen you, Tinsy Fly. I haven't seen you for a while. Unless his mistress did it and then lied about it, him telling her that she was already dead. Absolutely. So that's what we're going to kind of get into. So I remember, again, as I was saying earlier, the trial, they, um, their, Scott Peterson was quote unquote winning. He had an alibi because he went fishing, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that got really got him in trouble is his mistress, Amber Fry, went to the police and said, well, <laughs> well, <laughs> he had told me Detroit Lions roar. Yes, congratulations to the Detroit Lions for winning and making it to the uh, the NFC Championship game next week in Santa Clara against my team, the San Francisco 49ers. Um, Kathy Mays, your playoff run has been wonderful, but it unfortunately will come to an end. Back to what I'm talking about. Uh, so, okay. So Amber Fry had come forward and said, look, uh, Scott told me on, on, I believe it was December the 8th, 2002, that this was going to be the quote, the first time he was going to spend Christmas without his wife. Now, Lacey Peterson, this was like weeks before she actually officially went missing. So that was kind of an odd statement that he had made. And there's, you know, and I'm going to do a deeper breakdown of this, like a, as an actual video, because as I'm talking about it, I'm realizing that there's also a lot of similarities here with the Chris Watts case. And I know a lot of you guys have definitely, um, have definitely felt, uh, it definitely have very strongly opinionated about Chris Watts. And I've done a side by side with my father, comparing my father to Chris Watts. You guys can check that out in my true crime videos and in the podcast right here, call your Landry show a playlist here on YouTube. You guys can check that out. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, it's interesting because, you know, my father's mistress in the trial, she was one who, uh, you know, she pled the fifth, uh, pretty much the entire time. So didn't get a lot out of her, but obviously this Amber Fry took either a plea deal or just cooperated with authorities. I mean, as she should, right. But there's a lot of speculation that's gone on from these other podcasts. So just to give you a very broad view of just and the intricacies of the timeline. So, and there are two, obviously, as I said, contrarian views on all this. And look, I am just a neutral party. I'm literally here to make a show to entertain y'all. And look, Scott Peterson is, has been found guilty in a court of law for the murder of his wife, Lacey, and his son, Connor. He was facing the death penalty. He's now serving life in prison, right? The Los Angeles Innocent Project has taken up his case, citing potential new DNA evidence, something about a van, something about some the, uh, you know, some of these details are really graphic. So I'm going to get into this in a second. But again, I'm not a judge or jury. I am literally, <laughs> I am not a lawyer. I am not a psychologist. I do not work in law enforcement. I am just a guy who has been through a lot of shit. And that's why you come here and you, you like my opinion. By the way, it's going to be on a t-shirt very soon. Uh, you like my opinion. You're interested in what I have to say. And this is what it is. So there are two po different podcasts that and responses, rebuttals to these podcasts discussing this type of thing. And, you know, again, this is the thing with conjecture and, you know, also 20 years, something happening 20 years ago. I mean, if I was to actually take a deep dive into my father's own case, I'm sure I would find all kinds of indiscrepant, uh, 
uh, discrepancies in in evidence potentially or sort of things or timing or just the fact that a 12 year old boy testified against his father in open court, which is something that does not happen nowadays. Um, but I did witness and, and this is one of the things I'm very grateful about and that I talk about a lot on this show is when I'm talking about other true crime cases and I'm looking at things, I am very, very grateful in a lot of ways because when we talk about the Murdoch case, right? talking about Buster Murdoch and his reaction and not, you know, there's a, there's a really, there's a really big deal with when you don't really know what happened, right? I am 100% certain that my father murdered my mother because I heard it happen. And I saw my, the way my father's behavior was prevaricative and the way that he tried to cover up things and how his whole demeanor changed. I lived with that for 25 days. And January is always a really dicey month because today is January 21st. And that means that this was the day that my father told me that he was going to take me to Florida for a father and son bonding trip. And I went to the police and I said, he's going to take me to Florida and I'm not coming back. And then 25, six, seven, 30 years later, I find out from the judge, which is live on this podcast, that my father had a fixer in Florida that did his dirty work for him. So I guarantee if I had gone on that trip with my father, you wouldn't have this wonderful, amazing guy to poke fun at and to laugh with and to engage in all of these fun stories um, or not so fun stories, but to get your sort of fun opinion uh, because I wouldn't be here a hundred percent. Just like I know that if I looked up when he was coming down the hallway after murdering my mother, I wouldn't be sitting here either. I digress, but this is how every January is for me, by the way, because it all plays back in my mind and it's just, um, it's tough because I have a lot of other challenging things going on in my personal life right now. And this is, this does not help <laughs> the situation by any stretch of the imagination, but I digress on that. We'll get into that later. Um, okay. So the murder of Lacey Peterson and her unborn son occurred on December 24th of 2002 in Modesto, California. The Petersons had dinner plans with Lacey's parents that night, so Scott decided to go fishing during the day. Lacey had separate plans of her own. She was also eight months pregnant right from the beginning. Scott was pretty much the only suspect. The bodies were found around three and a half months later in the San Francisco Bay Area, where he also was fishing. He was arrested, and the trial was a media frenzy. He was convicted in 2004, sentenced to death in 2005. The California Supreme Court overturned his, his sentence in 2020 and 20. 21 and he was resentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole so that is a little more background on the case uh and many people you know the peterson the the peterson family obviously is very much rah-rah for his innocence however um you know lacy's family is pretty much not and look, a lot of people also argue when looking at this particular case that Scott Peterson was more so convicted of being like an asshole because he was cheating on his wife, having an affair with this mistress, apparently was not a very nice guy in his relationship with his wife. There were issues as well. Again, a lot of the stuff that I've read gives me these sort of weird parallels with Chris Watts. And we all know how that ended up. I mean, just as gruesome and just, you know, absolutely absolutely horrific um a friend a friend of mine uh she does big mad true crime heather from big mad true crime she really does some deep dives on the whole chris watts thing and it's very fascinating you should check out her podcast um but uh yeah there's a lot so for me when i'm looking at this there's a lot of parallels with chris watts you know obviously this wanting of another life and also the pressure of a child and so when i think about it uh, he was, so he's 51 right now, I believe, uh, you know, he was in, you know, what his, uh, late twenties at the time. So, you know, that doesn't seem very odd when you're married to start a family at that age. I mean, I don't have children, um, which is probably a good thing. I have furry children, but, uh, I do, I do think that, uh, that Scott Peterson, I, I don't know if he was, if he meant to be, uh, to be an asshole or he just was an asshole like who knows who knows but um again a lot of parallels now huffington posted a story on this and why because i've tried to find some stuff i, I went to court tv to try to get these guys to talk about what what was really going on and they were not very coherent hosts 
Um, so I was, I didn't find any information on this. So according to the Huffington Post, Los Angeles Inter uh, Innocence Project is taking up the infamous case of Scott Peterson, alleging, alleging that, quote, newly discovered and previously undisclosed evidence could support his claim that he was wrongfully convicted in 2004 of murdering his wife and unborn son. In new court filings on Wednesday, so this past Wednesday, day after the Murdoch debacle, Wednesday 17th, Wednesday the 17th, lawyers for the LA Innocence Project claim that evidence points to other possible suspects in the killing of Lacey Peterson, 27, who was eight months pregnant with their son, Connor, when she disappeared in Modesto, California. It's also nice that they had a name for their unborn child. I didn't know people named, um, named their children before they were born. I guess that makes sense. They would, of course. I feel like my name came and they were pulling it out of a hat. And they're like, ah, oh, this sounds good and weird. Collier, Collier Landry, because Landry is, so you guys know, is my middle name. Uh, Lacey Peterson's remains and those of her unborn fetus were found a day apart on a San Francisco Bay shore in, in April of 2003. So not two and a half months, like a long time later, like, like almost like four months later. Prosecutors argued that Peterson had dumped his wife's weighted down body overboard from his fishing boat. At the time, he was having an affair, telling his girlfriend weeks before that Lacey Peterson went missing and that his wife had died. Okay, see, I don't, I didn't know that. Amber Fry or Frey, it's, it's Amber Fry, but it's spelled like Frey, which is also a great band, the Frey. Um, the uh, Los Angeles, uh, um, when the when Pearson was arrested near San Diego in 2003, he had dyed his hair blonde. Oh, I do remember this. I remember that he had dyed his hair blonde and was carrying $15,000 in cash. Authorities tracking him said they had feared he might flee to Mexico. Which really, you know, there's we do have an extradition treaty with, with Mexico, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So, like, they would have gotten back pretty, pretty quickly. But what we were in... Well, we were just coming through 9-11, a couple of years removed from that. We were fighting two wars overseas in the Middle East. Uh, oh, it sounds familiar. Um, uh, maybe we were distracted and we didn't have the best international relationship at the time. I digress. The Los Angeles Inter In Innocence Project, a nonprofit devoted to exonerating wrongfully incarcerated people in California prisons, is based at California State University, Los Angeles, and is not affiliated with the National Innocence Project, which a lot of people... When this news came out, which is what caught us my attention, which was what caused you guys to DM me, is everybody's like, the Innocence Project is taking up his case. And it's like, no, it's the Los Angeles Innocence Project. In a statement shared with HuffPost, the LAIP confirmed it is, it is representing Scott Peterson and is, quote, investigating his claim of actual innocence. Peterson's attorney, Pat Harris, said his team welcomed the assistance of the Los Angeles Innocence Project. We are very excited to have the incredible attorneys from the LA Innocence Project lend their considerable expertise to helping prove Scott Peterson's innocence, he said in a statement shared with Huffington Post. Now, uh, now, just to clarify too, apparently all of this work that Peterson did that, that ended up getting um, uh, Peterson into the Los Angeles Innocence Project and getting them to take up his case and his bid for a um, for uh, um, uh, for a, a new hearing or or to become exonerated, he had done all the work apparently himself. Had been writing the letters and being proactive with his case in prison. I recognize this behavioral pattern because my father does the same thing. My father forever, you know. And this is one of the things when we were discussing Alec Murdoch and his role in prison a lot of you were like oh how is he getting certain things oh i realized my hair was looking a little wacky okay sometimes i have good day hair days you know it's very humid today it was rained all weekend by the way in los angeles which we don't get a lot of rain uh so my hair is a mind of its own just so you know uh it's the humidity and that's how i'm that's what i'm sticking with um so initially uh so you, you asked about like alec murdoch and how does somebody like him survive in prison right he's a lawyer so Granted, he probably has a lot of enemies, but he probably has a lot more friends because everybody in prison, when you go in prison, they could be caught red-handed, smoking gun, the body in the trunk of their car, and they are still claiming they're innocent, and they're all trying to get out of prison. In prison, there are more innocent people in prison than you would think because they all think they're innocent. I have yet, very famously, in the movie The Shawshank Redemption, Red, Red, and Andy Dufresne, who is played by Morgan Freeman, is Red, and Andy Dufresne, played most famously by Timothy Robbins or Tim Robbins. 
they're talking and he's and he's saying how everybody is innocent in the prison and and red says i'm you know only he's like what did you do he's like only guilty man in shawshank because you know my experience in dealing with prisons going in talking to other inmates my father sharing me stories in his letters from prison is that all these guys are fighting a case so somebody like scott pearson there are law libraries that are available to them which i'm sure there's it's much more extensive now due to the uh you know the democratization of the internet right but also or the proliferation pro proliferation rather maybe or both uh you know he has access to certain things and uh you know obviously he's making these appeals and these pleas to try to get out it doesn't mean that there's any merit to that, but if you can get the attention of something, some or something or someone, you can get people to kick up the dust on the case and hopefully get a uh, get a case revisited by a judge and maybe even get an exoneration. Now, this works great for people who are innocent, who really truly are innocent, who have wrongfully been been incarcerated, had evidence planted on them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for the wrong type of people, they can also take advantage of the system, which is what we talk a lot about with Alec Murdoch, right? And as I always say, the system needs to work for the worst of us so it can work for the best of us. That's really the thing is if you don't have these protections in place, if you are an innocent person that's in prison and you are trying to get out, you know that there's hope because uh, it does happen. Again, it's a flawed system, but it is a system that has worked and helped preserve this country for what it is or what it will be i don't know i digress back to what it said uh pearson's initial death sentence was overturned in 2020 and he was re-sentenced re to life in prison without parole in 2021 a judge denied his request for a new trial in 2022 and he is a current is currently appealing that decision in its motion for post-conviction conviction discovery the laip uh, los angeles innocence project alleges that peterson's quote claim of actual in in innocence could be supported by its own review and evidence that was not shared with his defense before trial it is requesting records of police interviews and potential witnesses photographs and video and tips shared with investigators according to abc news which were first reported the new motion peterson's attorneys contend that a burglary burglary across the street from the couple's home at the time of his wife's disappearance may be linked to her murder and the filings also seeks information about whether a burned out van found near the Modesto airport was connected to the burglary. In a separate motion, the LAIP requested that DNA testing be performed on bloodstains found on a mattress in the van. Couple of things. Couple of things. Okay, so we get hung up on a lot of DNA evidence. And if you guys uh, have listened to the other podcast that I do with, with Tara Newell, which is called the survivor squad. We, uh, interview, um, Amanda Knox and Amanda Knox is an exoneree. She is an advocate for anyone who is wrongfully incarcerated, but she talks to us a lot about what DNA is, what that looks like and how her DNA was found on the murder weapon that took the life of her roommate, Meredith. I cannot remember Meredith's last name. Uh, and then how she ended up being roped into all of this when, of course, she did not kill her. Um, but talking about DNA and how DNA can just flake off and be spread. So really this sort of the process of utilizing DNA to find a suspect, sometimes you can have thousands of people's DNA on it. It's just, it's all about like the volume of the DNA from what I've come to understand. Again, not a lawyer, not a psychologist, not a law enforcement, just a guy who's been through a lot of shit. But from what I've come to understand is that this DNA evidence can also be tainted and it's also cannot be preserved in a way. So the fact that we're 20 years later and they're going to go back and look at DNA evidence feels a little interesting, but you know, DNA can be contaminated. It's not a perfect process, just like it's not a perfect system. So it'll be interesting, interesting to see who actually, um, who actually comes up and what they actually come up with. By the way, Kelly O, thank you so much for becoming a YouTube member. I want to go in the comments too. Let's see what you guys are saying. Uh, Karen Kowalski, uh, uh, sorry, Kozlowski, Karen Kozlowski. Yes. Collier is neutral and smart. Yes, I do. I try to maintain fair and balanced. <laughs> what do I got that from? I try to ma maintain an unbiased opinion because the really guys, just to be honest with you, if you kind of jump to one side and the other and the other, like it doesn't do anyone a bit of good. If you can see something, from both sides and try to be as objective as possible when you absolutely know nothing about 
either side, <laughs> it's really, really good to do. And a lot of times I think one of my sort of um, things that I feel poisons the well in true crime consumption and in true crime cases with the general public and sort of leads to a lot of tabloid conjecture and things of that nature is that uh, people just jump in on both sides because they're because they're they have a bias and they end up being coming uh, put into sort of a vacuum or their own echo chamber where they only want to hear the responses. We see this in the polarization the polarization currently that is in our democracy right now with both political parties. They're both living in uh, unfortunately people not all members of parties but they're all living in their own echo chambers and only wanting to hear what they think and see and and I think that's a really uh, myopic way to look at things which by the way, I no longer suffer from myopia. Well, I'm sure it'll come back because as you guys know, it has been officially January 22nd will be one month since I actually, since I got my LASIK surgery, as you see, I, there's no more glasses. I'm reading the screen. It is the most amazing thing ever. And my distance vision is starting to come in too. I'm very excited. I go back for my appointment on the 23rd and I'll keep you all posted. Um, let's go to your comments though. Court McNeil say the only ones who who really know are, yes, absolutely Court McNeil. Court McNeil is also the associate producer on the podcast and my assistant. She does a fantastic job. And she's asking for email addresses for all of our mods too because we don't have anybody, uh, any mods. Um, uh, she says the only ones who know are Scott, Lacey, and Connor, and two of them aren't here to speak for themselves. May they both rest in peace. Absolutely. And that's what I say too with the even the Murdoch situation is the only people that know Alec Murdoch <laughs> you know, uh, Maggie and Paul and two out of the three are not here. May God rest their souls. So it's very, it, it's, you know, and again, even with my father, like, I don't really know what happened other than what I heard happen, what I observed and what I testified to, which was all completely independent of any interference from anyone, because it all happened before I ever reported a single thing to the police. So, um, it's interesting. No, he killed Lacey and Connor. Watch the whole, whole trial. He is evil. Yes. Um, again, he has been convicted in a court of law and he was sentenced to death too. Uh, so I'm going to err on the side of the law and say that that's what he was convicted for. But again, I wasn't there. So I don't know. Um, it sounds, I will say, it sounds like from everything I've gotten to know about Scott Peterson, that he wasn't a really great guy. He wasn't like a stand-up guy. <laughs> like he had a mistress while his wife was pregnant. And again, I'm not here to comment on people's relationship dynamics. We all know that people's relationships and their dynamics can be very convoluted. Uh, but not usually if you're going to have a kid, you have like the mistress. All this. It's just, it's messy. I don't like messiness. I'm not a messy person. I don't like sloppiness. I don't like misinformation. I don't like, it, it's just a personal preference. I try to sort of, life is complicated enough <laughs> to be sloppy. It just is. Uh, and my father was very, very messy. All the stuff with his mistress, all of it, 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 it wreaked havoc on so many people's lives, including my half sister who was born 12 days before his arrest. I digress. Collier, I just find it very weird. He was having an affair, lying his pants off literally when Lacey disappeared. So typical to other cases. No, absolutely, Karen Isabel Stewart. That is absolutely 100% right. Uh, yeah, I find the same thing in my father's case. I find it very interesting. Uh, TNC Fly says, yes, her body was in such a decomposed state. I can imagine I, I, I can imagine what that could have survived. I believe you're meaning the DNA evidence. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, we all know that like when bodies wash up on shores, which is like absolutely horrific and terrible you know you see these things and and um you know I, I just think back to watching the jinx on hbo which is apparently having a second season because he was you know finally was sentenced to prison and you know uh so i'm really 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 interested to see what andrew jarecki <laughs> has done in the second season of the jinx i'll probably cover it too because i'm very interested in it and if you have not seen my film a murder in mansfield we also have a hot mic jinx sort of scenario in my own film as well uh, however, yes, there is a lot in, in a body. If it is washed up, so look again, I'm not an expert, but you know, if it's been floating around in the San Francisco Bay, and which for those of you that may or may not know, underneath the salt water of the San Francisco Bay is a, a, a sort of like well of fresh water. So you have this sort of mix there too. So God knows what could have happened. I mean, it's just, it's all very horrific anyways. And apparently her body was was um you know 
had been i'm trying to think of a polite way to say this it 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 was not in a very put together state if you will youtube monitors i gotta <laughs> i gotta be careful how i rephrase those things um anyways i'm going through uh are Lacey's parents still living i'm not sure actually uh 2 14 24 my daughter's murderer's first appeal i am i'm i'm going that's uh, i'm going that's scary so happy you're so wise and here today well thank you so much Kat. well thank you so much kathy mays for saying what you said i am sorry that you are um that you are going through that that's terrible i think it is important for you as a family advocate to speak up for your daughter and if you feel that this person who, who who took your daughter's life uh should not be released from prison you should stand up and you should say that and i and i am proud of you for having the courage of, since you're going to the hearing for doing that because that's really cool not a lot of people can do that it takes a lot of guts um it takes a lot a lot of guts guts and yes super planner girl uh i am here to make all of you feel safe that's like what this is this is not a this is a judgment-free zone you know what i mean uh i try to be very very neutral um just because why why are we going to be mad if scott peterson if peterson is in, incident innocent so is keith d and i'm being very sarcastic Keith D. Oh, is that uh so Keith D is the uh to the suspect in the Tupac Shakura murder. Correct me if I'm wrong, David. Um God, what a like what a mess that is. I haven't even dived in that in a minute. I'm sure that's just completely uh completely a mess. Her mother and stepfather who raised her are alive. Her bio dad passed uh, has passed away. That's interesting to know. Um Collier, did you catch Natalia Speaks? Um, I have not watched, I have not watched Natalia speaks. I've watched the mysterious case of Natalia grace. I have not watched the follow-up, the second season of that Natalia speaks. And the reason like that stuff is really hard for me to watch because people have told me about it. And apparently she was, um, apparently she has, uh, she really was like a little girl. Like when they took her to the, to live in the apartment, I mean, spoiler alert guys, but she brought it up, uh, that people apparently, um, uh, apparently, uh, you know, the, she was sent to live in this apartment and she was like, literally like a child. I mean, it's, it, it's heartbreaking to me. Uh, Amanda Michaels, welcome from Erie PA. Uh, and it's probably very snowy and cold Erie PA. Are you close to Mill Creek township? And have you seen my father's house where my mother's body was found? Let me know in the comments below, Amanda Michaels. Um, because uh, true story, I've told this on the podcast before, but I had long before I made a murder in Mansfield, I was having a party at my house. I had made a film with a producer and I was very new to the film industry. I didn't even know what I was doing. I don't know how we fumbled through making this thing, but it was an indie film. But we were talking and we were drinking at the time. Uh, you know, by the way, somebody mentioned in the comments, they said, call your looks like you're on something or blah, blah, blah. Just so you know, my my um, my vice of choice was alcohol and I quit drinking alcohol November 5th, 2020. So just for the record, almost four years. So um, just saying. Uh, very cold. Uh, yes and yes. Okay, so you have been to the house. That's interesting to know, Amanda Michaels, uh, which is right on the lake. Um, but uh back to what i was saying so we were drinking having some drinks long time ago and he had filmed a made a film in uh in erie pennsylvania and we were just talking and i had and we of course you're drinking your little you know and i didn't tell a lot of people my story when i lived in la a lot of people didn't know it, but we were becoming friends and we were talking and, and we, he and i just bonded his, his name was mark uh also a sober guy as well uh recently uh got a few years under his belt as well um but we uh we were talking and we were hanging out and i told him a little bit of my story and i swear to god he stops and he looks at me and he was white as a ghost and he goes i know the house you're talking about he's like i can't believe it i remember when they picked us up at the airport they wanted to drive us past this house to tell us about this murder that had occurred and this whole trial and everything and he goes that's your, that was where, that's your dad. That was the whole, and I was like, yeah, I mean, of all the gin joints in all of the world, that's, you know, talking, hanging out. And he's, I thought he's, his, I thought he, he was white as ghost. His chin hit the floor. He's like, I can't believe that. So yeah. Shout out to my friend, Mark, Mark, who, uh, 
who was there and told me the story. It was wild. Um, I went down the rabbit hole on the Tupac Shakur stuff. Yes, crazy. Um, uh, very crazy. Lots of crazy stuff. Yeah, I'm sure. Old Lady Snoop also have been to the house. Also from Erie, PA. Small world. Old Lady Snoop. Wow. Wild stuff. Lacey's dad, Ron Gransky, passed away in April 2018. Her father, Dennis Roca, passed away um, a few. Lacey's stepdad, and then her real father, Robert uh, Dennis Roca, passed away a few months later in December 2018. Um, yes, Yanina Cueva sobriety. Sobriety is a whole thing, but I'm not like a hardcore sober person because I guess like people who are they don't let you drink coffee. You can't have caffeine. You can't do any of that stuff. That it's, it's not not my nobody's taking my Nespresso machine away from me. That's it. I have thought about cutting back a little bit because sometimes I realize like, oh, I drank four espressos this morning. <laughs> Defenders of Scott say it wasn't weird for him to go fishing solo because Lacey's stepdad also liked to do that. Yeah, I mean, um, again, but apparently... Um, he had changed his mind or he had, or correct me if I'm wrong, court McNeil, but hadn't, hadn't, um, hadn't Scott Peterson purchased because he was supposed to do something. Uh, I can't remember what he was doing, but he decided to go fishing instead, uh, before going to dinner at Lacey's parents' house and decided to go to fishing instead. And then, um, uh, he, he had claimed he was supposed to go golfing. That's it. But he quote changed his mind. Now, golfing, um, you know, this is Modesto, California, northern central, northern California, but north central California. It's cold that time of year. It's cold that time of year, but he was going to go golfing. There's some beautiful golf courses up there, by the way. <laughs> Let me tell you. Not played any, but they're beautiful. Uh, so he's supposed to go golfing, but he decided to go fishing. Two totally different things. Actually thinking, putting on my bucket list this summer, not bucket list, but my list this summer. Going to golf more, by the way. Decided that this morning at like 6 a.m. Um, <clears throat> he changed his mind, but apparently he had purchased the fishing license days before. So he already knew he was going to go fishing. So that's kind of a weird thing. There's a lot of these interesting things last minute, but he bought the license. Oh, two days prior. Okay. Got it. Super plan. Uh, uh, planner girl says teensy like an open marriage style, or she just didn't care. I wonder. Oh, well now I have to go backtrack to the, to the comment from teensy fly. Uh, you don't look off your baseline to me. Yeah, I'm definitely not off my baseline. I mean, I have a lot of energy, just so y'all know. Uh, I am a person who wakes up and uh, and jumps into. Natalia is feuding and is not living with her adopted parents. Yeah, I, I'm sure she is not. Well, the last I knew that she was, they were putting her in an apartment. Um, well, let's see what you guys said. And please feel free to comment. This is what this is all about, guys. Uh, Angela Niedermeyer says, hello, Mover Nation. Just catching this live. This case has always, always has my attention. What, when it happened, it was yet another pregnant woman in the U.S. that was killed. Yes. Like, absolutely terrible. Absolutely terrible. Don't know where you sit on the side of things when women are pregnant and people take things into their own hands, et cetera, et cetera. There's been some Supreme Court, uh, you know, decisions that came down and, and uh, you know, how that affects our healthcare system and prenatal care and women's uh, reproductive rights, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Very dicey. Very dicey. And women's healthcare in general. Um, I feel like 2023 and 20, I'd say the last several years have been tough years on women for sure, um, which is just wrong in my opinion but that's just me come golf in augusta <laughs> oh yeah absolutely well of course augusta augusta national call your i would be rosemary lamardi and uh athman says call your i would be the proudest mother on the planet if you were my boy you remind me of my boys i'm from near erie pa you're an articulate smart moral young man with many more qualities thank you so much that's very very sweet of you Unpopular opinion, but I don't think he did it. I think he was a scumbag, but a killer. I think there was reasonable, reasonable doubt, but the mistress finished him after OJ. He had no choice. Not sure exactly what you mean by that surviving the nightmare after OJ. He had no choice. Um, interesting. Don't know um, what that means, but hey, 
if you want to elaborate, that's great. To me, I think Lacey saw something and she was shut up. People saw her dog walking around and several seen a lady that looked like Lacey with two men and she didn't look comfortable with them. Um, now, again, <clears throat> this is something that I will sp speak to. So uh, usually people who are committing like a, a house robbery, um, they are not people that will commit a murder and mutilate a body. That's just my opinion. Um, because it gets sloppy. I mean, we'll see, obviously they're going to pull some DNA. They're going to interview some people. They're going to go back over footage. There seems to be ways to debunk some of these myths that go on, which we will of course find out as they pursue this case who long, you know, this is probably going to take years, by the way, just to be honest, these, these things do, but it will be interesting to see, um, oh, Natalia was readopted. I think she meant feuding with the new parents. Um, it will be interesting to see what happens, but, uh, yeah, normally people who are committing one level of crime, don't escalate it to like the next level of crime, like an armed robbery in a house of just like, or, or not even an armed robbery, just a burglary of a house and somebody seeing something. Uh, usually you don't take hostages. You know, there's a certain levels to the crime. And I don't know what, again, not a lawyer, not a, just a guy, but there is a lot of people who oftentimes will not escalate a crime to a certain level. Like you have like certain things you'll do like, Oh, I'll go rob a liquor store. Oh, I'll go, um, I'll, I'll, I'll go steal a car. You know what I mean? But I won't kill somebody. You, you know what I mean? I'm not saying me, but I'm, I am I definitely won't kill somebody. But uh, there are a lot of people with, and, and just from talking to people uh, who have been incarcerated with like three, three strikes laws, for example, they steal a car, they have drugs, they, they rob a liquor store, all within the span of like a year or two. You know what I mean? And yes, they're, they're offenders and they committed violent crimes, but they would never actually physically hurt someone. They, you know, pointing, you know, getting into a situation like stealing a car, for example, drug stuff. Those are sort of victimless crimes in a lot of ways. You know, carjacking and killing someone, totally different story. But stealing a crime or stealing a car, so there's there's not somebody who you're, I mean, yes, the person who owns the car is victimized, but you're not putting someone's life in danger in a way, if that makes sense. I mean, other ways maybe, but metaphorically speaking the documentary i watched mentioned, mentioned several other pregnant pregnant women in the area who had been in some odd situations can't remember the details that brought about some doubt for me i would like to know super planner girl what that documentary is because i will watch it now i'm curious there was a supposed eyewitness sighting of lacy with two men outside a van somewhere in the country and she looked scared interesting Surviving the nightmare says he had no chance. OJ got away with the murder and California couldn't take the chance. There was so much to this case. Yeah. So you're saying there were some political motivations behind it. Well, I mean, it could very, very well be true. There could have been some political motivations around it. Absolutely. Um, old lady Snoop. I did hear about those two guys. Uh, Super planner girl. I heard that was that as well, but a source I saw claimed that most of those were partner related which is sad in itself. I don't know if this is true or not. Yeah, it's an odd coincidence, maybe. Karen Kowalski, uh, Kos Koslovsky. I always think about Home Alone when I hear about burglars. Burglars are pretty stupid and probably not killers. Yeah, a lot of people, again, they, you know, a lot of people who are doing things like this. Now, there is right now a, a massive problem and it's it, everywhere in the United States, apparently. It started off in, in San Diego um, but there is a Chilean crime ring, which I actually want to do a thing about this too, because my friends who were in Beverly Hills were burglarized by these people and they were chasing them up in the hills and Beverly Hills police department and drones and helicopters and everything. They got one of the guys, but they're supposedly these supposedly Chile, the country in South America, um, has a habit of, uh, of, um, theft tourism and these Chilean gangs are very sophisticated. They don't hurt people. They just go in and they very, in very sophisticated ways, uh, they know how to crack through the top highest end security systems. And they basically will bring guys in and they literally, they case out places for months and months and months, uh, analyzing the patterns of the people who are coming and going from the, from the residences or the buildings. And they will go in, strike, 
strike they shut down all the systems they shut down the, you know they get they bypass all these security systems and some and they literally will not try to crack the safe they will steal the safe <laughs> it's wild um this has been happening all over the country because as my friend is telling me this on new year's eve and all this thing that happened and they did not publish it in the news there wasn't a word about it in los angeles it, this is only from eyewitness accounts uh, I'm Googling it and it happens in the Detroit area. It's happened in San Francisco. It's happened in San Diego counties. Uh, it's happening all across Atlanta. This is a sort of thing that is occurring right now. And it's been occurring for several years in the United States. So interesting. And it's not anything to do with border crisis or anything. These are actual people getting on airplanes and then organizing themselves here in the United States and organizing these burglaries. It's wild, wild. But I digress on that. I wish I was half as awesome as Collier says, Noah O'Reilly. Thank you so much, Noah O'Reilly. If the robbers were stealing to get drug money, would they want to shut up an eyewitness? Again, it's, it's, it's quite an escalation. It'd be quite an escalation. Have they said what new evidence is yet uh, for the LA Innocence Project to be, to be able to take this up? So again, I pretty much think that from everything that we're reading here, uh, that there's this burn van that, that was found near the Modesto airport that they are talking about. Uh, this burn van that may have some DNA. That's one of the things we're looking at. These eyewitness accounts, this videotape footage. But again, as I started at the top of the conversation, uh, at the top of the episode, the thing is, is that the Los Angeles Innocence Project is a much smaller organization than the national innocence project which is what everybody had assumed and that's why this thing caught wildfire and probably got picked up by news wires i mean it is scott peterson it was a huge case right but uh everybody thought it was the innocence project that was confused and they came out on twitter and made statements saying this is not us they've got statements on their website this is not us this is the los angeles innocence project uh national innocence project is very well funded and has many donors millions like a million people on their list or something like that so yeah totally different organization but it picked up steam because of that so that, at least that's what my what my intuition tells me but uh everything that i researched they don't have anything necessarily that is very specific they haven't released a lot of details other than they were taking it up back to the article in huff post peterson's attorneys contend that a burglar across the street from the couple's home at the time of his wife's disappearance may be linked to her murder. And the filing also seeks information about whether a burned out van near the Modesto airport was connected to the burglary. In a separate motion, the Los Angeles Innocence Project requested that DNA testing be performed on blood stains found on a mattress in the van. Authorities still have not been able to determine how, where, or when Lacey Peterson was killed. Peterson's trial lasted for more than five, oh, it's five months. That's right. It was a long time. And the jury deliberated for more than seven days. Again, not like a three-hour verdict in the Murdoch trial. Seven days. One of the jurors was replaced during the deliberations. I also remember that as well. In the end, jurors cited Peterson's lies and inconsistencies as driving factors in reaching a guilty verdict. Now, again, you know, uh, lying and deception and not having your story straight. Um, now, I don't think I don't think Scott Peterson testified at his trial. I think Mark Garagos was a good enough lawyer to say, shut up, sit down, don't say anything. Uh, there is unbearable sadness in my life, Lacey's mother, Sharon Roca said in an impact victim's impact statement before Peterson was sentenced to death. The Scott I knew is the one Lacey loved and I entrusted him with her. You made a conscious decision to kill Lacey and Connor. You planned and executed their murders. You threw them away like a piece of garbage. Oy vey. And then it's an advertisement for, uh, now let's see. There are some other articles here. So on December 20th, 2022, a superior court judge had found that no evidence uh, found no evidence that the first trial in 2004 was tainted by a rogue juror who lied about her own history of abuse to get on the panel. Yeah, that was something. Okay, so this is something that had come up too. There was this rogue juror. <laughs> there was this rogue juror who had come to the attention of the court. And guys, you guys have been following me. Some of you are here because of the Murdoch stuff. 
I'm going to give you one guess. One guess is all you guys get. One guess is all you guys get on what this juror did post-trial. You get five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. That's right. She wrote a book. What a surprise. She wrote a book. <laughs> um, this juror's name was something niece who co-wrote a book about the case with other jurors previously denied that her personal experiences influenced her during the trial court documents that stated that several of her answers in a juror questionnaire were false quote in certain aspects, but said her answers were not quote motivated by pre-existing or improper bias against Peterson and were quote, the result of a combination of good faith misunderstanding of the questions and sloppiness in answering. Insert Jeopardy music. Oh God, I can't wait. Uh, I can't wait to, uh, to to actually be able to queue up all that stuff. As the program gets bigger, as more patrons and channel members and more support comes in, we can do all those fun things because I would be able to do all of that. That would be fabulous. Fabulous. I'm very jealous of my dear friend, Joel Waldman over at Surviving the Survivor because he has his brother-in-law working for him doing stuff. And he controls all the controls for him. I'm just sitting here with my little keyboard controlling one man band. It's a lot of work, guys, but I'd love to have audio cues. Wouldn't that be fun? That would be so much fun. Cue Jeopardy music. Oh, man. We'd have to, of course, clear everything through YouTube because then it wouldn't work. Um, but again, a California judge on Tuesday, so this was back in December 2022, December 20th, 2022, it rejected a new trial, a new murder trial. For Scott Peterson, nearly 20 years after he was charged with dumping the bodies of his pregnant wife, Lacey, and unborn child, Peterson alleged the resulting trial uh, um, alleged the resulting trial that gripped the world was tainted by a rogue juror who lied about her own history of abuse to get on the panel and was initially and initially sent to get him on the panel that initially sent him to death row because she had had domestic abuse. The, the sad thing is, is that obviously if you're you're serving on a case and they're going to ask you about the stuff like that. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people do have a history of domestic abuse. So probably trying to find somebody, uh, oh, I realize I have this current comment up here. Yes, I do believe he is a psychopath narcissist though. Uh, there is some definite things, uh, strength to you this January. Thank you so much, Angela Niedermeyer. I really appreciate it. You plus STS are my faves. Yes. Joel has his, uh, brother-in-law working for him, controlling all the, all the controls behind the great, the curtain in the great and powerful Oz. It's very funny. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe, everyone. It really helps out the channel. Yes, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It does help out the channel. Usually Gen X Granny says that, but she is not here today. That is unfortunate, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> oh, Court McNeil said they wrote a book. Court, you already knew the answer to that. They have no more case against him than a lamb has against a wolf. Um, interesting. I got to say, I heard whispers of him being let's say less guilty. I blocked it out, but it keeps coming back to me. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to believe it. Are you talking about, uh, are you talking about Scott Peterson? Uh, they weren't thieves. They were serial. Okay. They were serial offenders scooping up pregnant women. The ones who got Lacey got others in other States and areas. That is interesting. Well, again, old lady, Snoop, we're going to see what happens with all this. Again, there's a lot of conjecture flying around and a lot of these myths are debunked and I've talked for an hour about this and I haven't even gotten into the actual research, which I'm going to have to probably do another episode about it. Lucky for you guys, we'll be talking about this more. Oh, hi, Gen X Granny. What's going on? What's going on? It'll be the most entertainment Scott has had in years. Probably so. Why have I not done the Menendez brothers? Uh, interestingly enough, I just haven't done it. Um, yeah, I just haven't done it. It's a time, whatever. I will do it. You guys have all requested it. I actually have a, I, I actually have two different friends who are producers that are working on two different documentaries about the Menendez brothers. And have talked to me about a lot of stuff. So um, uh, yeah, I do. And also to be honest with you guys, I wasn't really wanting to talk about true crime, but you guys have roped me back in like in the Godfather part three when Alex Pacino is every time I get out, they bring me back in because it brought me back in. I started talking about the Murdoch thing. I thought it was funny. And now here I am, you know, they, I thought it was funny about not about the Murdoch situation, about the book and Becky Hill. I find it kind of like a Carl Hyacinth novel. Like I've said before, uh, I'm going to have to talk about all this again. We're going to have to come back. 
for another episode later on. I'm going to go do my more research and read everything. Uh, uh, Court McNeil put a lot of great uh, resources together for me. Uh, it just it was, there's just a lot going on in my world right at the moment. So uh, I'm uh, doing that, but uh, yeah, we will, we will revisit this for sure. Um, so yeah, this woman, what was her name? Miss nice, miss niece. Um, she was the juror. She wrote a book. There's a lot to unpack here. Uh, and I need to maybe, uh, I mean, maybe to refamiliarize myself with the case, uh, guys, it is four o'clock 401 to all of you who are watching the Kansas city chiefs and the Buffalo bills or who are there in person. You probably wouldn't be watching the show. I would hope not. Uh, sitting there suffering in that very cold weather underneath all that snow. I commend all of you. Um, I want to give a big shout out to all of my channel members and Patreon supporters. Without you guys, yours and your support, this channel and my content would not be possible. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who are new here, please click the like button, click subscribe. It helps with the algorithm. Please check out all my other content. I've got great lists and true crime cases, my own personal true crime story. All the stuff that I talk about in the Murdoz, which we will be back again talking about very, very soon in a couple of days. And um, you can check out all my content here on the channel. I appreciate all your support. You guys checking it out, spreading the word. It's We're all growing. This is all a big community. As you see, this is a safe place for all of you to engage. Uh, and it's it, and it's it's great. And I think for everyone for being respectful in the comments too, it's really, really great. Um so I'm really, I'm really excited. And uh, please, if you wouldn't mind emailing, uh, Court McNeil is going to put the email address. You can reach out to movingpastmurder at gmail.com if you are a, a moderator on this channel uh, because I don't have access to your email addresses. We're trying to collect it for everybody. And uh, yes, Drat says, go Bills. Go Bills. Like to see Josh Allen have a great game. And uh, hopefully uh, Patrick Mahomes won't whine. I mean, I, I, I really do like the Kansas City Chiefs until that game. And I just when he was whining, complaining about Kadarius Tony being lined up off sides and all that nonsense, I just thought that was I, – I can't get behind that. I'm so over the Kansas City Chiefs. It has nothing to do with Taylor Swift. I love Taylor Swift. Nothing to do with that. Just over them. <laughs> Gen X Granny, thank you so much. Become a YouTube member. Uh, also, click the sponsor link uh, in below. We're at Babbel. Babbel.com forward slash Collier. Check it out, uh, doing some, uh, offering 55% off your language, uh, your favorite language software on the internet. <clears throat> Learn a new language using Babbel. 2024 is your year. I've been using it. They're one of the sponsors. Um, and yeah, and uh, thank you all so much. I'll be back with this because this is a rabbit hole that I'm probably going to go down. Uh, until next time, y'all. I'll see you on the next one. This podcast is made possible by support from listeners just like you. For exclusive content around this podcast, please consider supporting me via Patreon by going to collierlandry.com forward slash support. Please subscribe via Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from, and please leave us a five-star review. If you want to see video episodes of this podcast, please check out my YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash collierlandry. You can find links to additional resources in the show notes of today's episode. This podcast is a production of Don't Touch My Radio. Copyright, Collier Landry.